Well, first of all, thanks to Zahra for putting together this wonderful series uh, and for inviting me. And from these distinguished guests, uh, I know I'm in trouble, but uh, <laughs> I'll push ahead anyway. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is really not the entirety of the Kura Rocks, uh, but one section of it. Uh, I'm actually going to start, uh, as you would expect from an anthropologist, um, to talk about some principles and ideas for how we describe and understand what's happening in this really incredibly complex kind of um, cultural system, societal system. Uh, I always think when I start into trying to figure out what's going on uh, to Adam Smith's 2005 article uh, in which he bemoaned how little we really understand about the social world of Kurorox's communities. Uh, to some degree that's been improved, but in many ways, uh, it's still very much true. So what I'd like to do is sort of lay out as quickly as I can some basic ideas and some definitions um, on the basis of which we'll be talking about some data, uh, largely from the homeland, from the South Caucasus and from Iran, not so much, sorry, uh, from the Taurus or um, the Levant. Clearly the idea of Kurok from an archeologist point of view um, is that we find this very distinctive black, highly burnished, handmade pottery, uh, which pretty much screams at us right away that there was a presence of people who shared some sort of cultural uh, affinity, which is represented by this pottery. Um, along with this, as we start to dig, we find, as Tony Sagona said, uh, an entire cultural package, including, yes, the pottery style, but also aspects of ritual, characteristics of housing. Uh, we have particularly though, however, focused in on the style of pottery as the leading variable in all of our discussions. And so Tony, uh, with whom I normally agreed wholeheartedly, um, claimed that the Kura rocks continued until 1600 BC, with which I completely disagree. Because I think even if we're just looking at the cultural aspect and every culture with a capital C has both the mental perceptions and also its economic, social and political organization. And the two are joined together in very important ways. And so, yes, certainly you can say that some small aspects of the pottery production continue into the early Kurgan and even beyond there. But in fact, I think the societies of the Kuroxes and the societies of the early Kurgan with its sudden disappearance from settled life, its militarism, uh, et cetera, is really something completely different. And so we can't just focus too much on that particular aspect. We have to understand it, but we also have to understand the wider belief. And also, even if pottery might look the same in different places in this incredibly diverse mountain environment, we have to understand that just because the pottery looks the same in the Taurus and the homeland, the process of adaptation that you get in the diaspora is a very different animal altogether. So of course, we all love to quote Carol Kramer, pods equal people. Some of us don't take it seriously at all, but the fact of the matter is potteries do have cultural meanings, do have social meanings. We have to be able to understand it, not just as a fact that sits on the ground, but as a very dynamic aspect uh, of culture um, that fortunately is left to us in great numbers. So why do traditions, uh, if you must, habitus last? Why do they change? Why do they end? Um, style is certainly an important aspect, but sometimes I think we're a little bit loose about the way we describe it. Style to me is really the perception of people at the time of what is appropriate. So is this pot made right? Is this the pot that I want? Is this the pot that I have some understanding of or is it not? Certainly from an archeologist point of view, from a a point of view of trying to put together a typology, it has aspects 
every pod has aspects of its manufacture, has aspects of its function, and pretty much what's left is the area where style is most important. These are changes that are made by the potters to meet this cultural understanding, this general desire. I also think of style um, as a kind of language. Uh, this for me has always been uh, an analogy that's worked very well because like language, style communicates identity. Imagine talking about being Armenian or Georgian uh, or Turkish or Persian without talking about the language that's sort of the center of their identity. Even the Serbs and the Croats who speak identical same language. It's called Serbo-Croatian for a good reason, namely that it's the same exact language, but in order to identify their difference, they actually write it in a different script. Same language, different script. Why? Because it's about identity. Language also communicates things about how people perceive the world. Um, as early anthropologists said, the world is made by words. So how these things are organized, how they are exchanged, how they are altered, says something about the nature of it. The other part of it, which particularly for the Kororoks, I think is an important element, is that of the dialects. Um, dialects are a really interesting problem. So we have the language, which we recognize as common, but within every language, you have subsets of language, which we define as dialects. Uh, in my own city, there are four distinct dialects. And in fact, in reading Labov, who did the work on the Philadelphia dialects, what becomes clear is the key element in talking about dialect is how much communication there is among people. He said, if you want to understand why there's a North Philadelphia dialect, all you have to understand is the segregation of the population of North Philadelphia and the fact that they are communicating so much among each other, they create their own codes. As do people in the main line, the, the wealthy suburbs, as do people in Port Richmond, the Rocky language if you're a film buff, uh, as the language in the area that I grew up, uh, which I worked very hard to get rid of. Uh, in the past, I would have said Jewian, um, and I thankfully don't do that anymore. It also has to do with where pottery is made and by whom. The more local the production, the more likely it is that these dialectical changes are going to be added into the pottery style. And so these are elements I think when we go about looking at pottery, we shouldn't just sort of take it as a, as a fact, we should look at it in terms of these other elements that I think are really quite important. So in terms of the old ideas that pots are people and new people show up, then it's obviously that new people have arrived, I think we have to disabuse ourselves of that idea pretty quickly. Um, as you can read, I won't read the whole thing, uh, Cole, who is certainly no wild radical anthropologist, wrote very succinctly about the fact that, you know, ethnic Arabic and historical sources make it very clear that style can change fairly rapidly as can the way people live the way they can organize themselves, even within a generation. To which I would add that in fact, I know of no case historical ethnographic, whether it be by conquest, natural disaster, plague, when an entire population simply disappears and is replaced by a new population entirely with a new population. So in every case, when we're talking about style change, we have to be clear to understand that there are processes of adoption happening? How does that actually work? Why is it happening in this particular place, in this particular time? For, um, as Dr. Helfing, hi Barbara, uh, has shown for Uruk pottery in the so-called colonies. In fact, almost all of the Uruk pottery in these colonies is made by locals. It's not imported, it's not brought by people. Uh, it's in fact made locally for some reason that we're still trying to address. Or you look at Karam Kanesh, which we know historically and documentary that 
it was occupied by traders from Assyria, and yet you don't find a single Assyrian potsherd in the Karum at all. So this idea of pottery and peoples really has to be understood in a much more clear way. Um, same thing happens in the South Caucasus, where you where Mark Isserlis and his uh, team were able to show that across a huge swath of the Kuroxus landscape, from the homeland to the furthest part of the diaspora, you have these commonalities in production technology that are happening at the same time. So we have to understand what's going on when we say it's a Kuroxus pot or it's a Kuroxus dialectic pot that is a different style. Uh, and we have to understand what the process is. Uh, if you want to see one case, I highly recommend uh, an oldie but goodie book by Irene Winter about the decorated best plate from Hassan Lu, in which she shows how an emulation of ideas from Neo Assyrian conquest is adopted in Hassan Lu to reflect ideas that they want to portray about themselves as a, an under, as a people of, of strong military prowess. We also have to be very careful that this package doesn't necessarily continue or end as one unit. Uh, this is from Hassan Lu 3.2, which is way, way after, uh, which we're down, down to 1600. And if you look at the andirons, they sort of look very Kura rocks. But when you look at the pottery, I don't think anyone would call the pottery of Godin 3.2 um, Kura rocks. So if we're going to look at this um, idea about style zones and differences of homeland and diaspora, um, when we met in Toronto for the uh, Kuroxis um, workshop, which was a, a wonderful entire week when 10 of us from all over the globe met and tried to make sense of what was going on with the Kuroxis. Uh, we found that you really have to divide it into subregions, the homeland being one, although even within the homeland, there's a clear difference between what we're calling the lower province, that is the Araxes River Basin, and the upper province, the Kura River Basin. But there are these different areas within the entire Kuroxes landscape that really have to be looked at in a different way. We're going to be looking, sorry, uh, only at the things on the right-hand side. So I'm sorry, the Umok, the Upper Euphrates and Western Taurus and Northern Caspian are going to have to be the topic of somebody else's lecture. So how do we understand these, this pottery? How do we understand how it reflects dialects? So I took Shingavit. I worked on all the Shingavit pottery and looked using the forms that Tony Sagona set up for us in 1984 and said, okay, where do these occur? So all of these numbers are different uh, types within the typology that we created for Shingavit. And where else they occur? So obviously you see other occasions, occurrences within uh, the lower province and also quite a few in the upper province of the homeland. You see quite a few in the Zagros and in the Taurus. Although interestingly, most of the ones that are typical of Shingavit only occur at Shingavit, which to me suggests the idea that locals are producing for themselves um, with this idea in their heads about what it should be and yet with their local variations. Uh, Godin IV, uh, the Kuroxus time, also has a similar issue. In fact, except for Pavey, the, the rim of uh, Godin 1A one, um, one, one bowls, every single type that you find at Godin 4 is found somewhere as far away as the Taurus. So I started uh, trying to understand. And again, when you look at all of the variations, again, by function, which is really important, we really need to look at style changing within functional groups that the different types are all over the place. 
And so how do we make sense of this? So I was looking at this material again, and I realized that maybe it's not so much the entire elements of our typology, that is the shape and the type. Maybe there is something else happening where they're taking particular aspects um, and putting the emphasis of their dialects on that. And so I show you three areas, each with their own dialect. And what seems to be the case, and hopefully some smart graduate student will sit down and actually work this out. This is sort of a very initial try at this, is what is so interesting about Yannick Ware, the so-called gray wares west of Lake Ormia, and of course the Chingavit Ware, is these surface processes, these surface manufacturers, don't happen anywhere else. Various pot forms, types, happen all over the place, but these particular uses of the surface are very localized. You don't find Yannick Ware in the homeland, nor do you find this gray ware, and you don't find the highly burnished, highly incised, decorated uh, Shingavi ware anywhere outside the homeland. In fact, at um, where I've been working uh, in the central Jordan Valley, which is actually my current project uh, with Yal Rotem and Mark Isserlis, we found a very interesting pattern that also speaks to the same idea, which is, at the beginning of the EB3, the Levantine EB3, these fellows arrive right when the site is reoccupied. So the site is abandoned for some decades. And then the local uh, EB3 population reoccupies the site. And at the same time, there appears the Kororoxus migrants, uh, the so-called Khirbit Karak, where people. Um, and at that initial stage, they are spending each one of has a very distinct, very different pottery style, very different surface. Um, and the Khirbit Karak potters are spending huge amounts of time on the surfaces in burnishing, mostly red, actually, not mostly black. Um, but all sorts of effort is being made to do this. But as the EB3 continues, what starts to happen is the two populations start to meld their technology you start to get a hybrid of the local EB3 and the Khirbit Kirok. And the first thing that happens when that process begins, which continues until the end of EB3 when the site is abandoned, is they stop worrying about the surface. They stop paying much attention to the surface. They don't do the burnishing. It's sort of dull yellow, gray, or brown surface, which is barely burnished at all, if at all. And so I think we have to be, again, very careful of what characteristics are we looking for when we look at style and things like that. Of course, we've heard a lot in the last couple of weeks, people ask, uh, was this society egalitarian? Uh, was Kona Shahar urban? Uh, and I think we have to be really clear about these terms because if we don't, we're really gonna be in trouble again because we'll be talking at odds with one another. Um, I found a really useful approach was actually one that Marcella Frangipani used for talking about um, the Halaf and the Ubaid in Mesopotamia, but I think it applies very clearly um, in the Kororoxas, and in fact wrote an article which you can find in the Veshrift for um, Frangipani. And she says there really are, there is not one egalitarian society. Egalitarianism really is about how positions are being created, how decisions are being made, how communities decide to interact and work together. And she says there are really two different kinds of egalitarian society. One she describes as horizontal, um, and I won't go through all of the different parts, but each has a very distinctive relation to how the society is integrated, how it's organized, what the locus of controls are, what the scale of society is, um, what sort of settlements there are. She said there is, however, still within a largely egalitarian framework, a uh, vertical egalitarian society. And interestingly, this exactly matches a new attempt by an anthropologist named Fisk 
to sort of throw out the old chiefs, you know, tribes, chiefs, states model and look for a new way of describing these variations and exactly match it. So for him, communal sharing is horizontal, equality sharing is vertical, and then you get coordination, which is ranked, and then of course, authoritarian uh, and hierarchical, which is states. On the matter of urbanization, I think we're being, we've been fairly loose about it. Um, it's been a hundred years that both social scientists and historians have worked on what it means to be urban. Um, and of late people seem to think the moment you throw up a wall, you've got an urban place. But I think we have to be clear that I don't think that's really the case. Number one, Adams very pithily wrote in um, Land Behind Baghdad that more is different simply because you have larger places. And again, even in the homeland in the KA2, when you really do see very distinct increases uh, in complexity and societal complexity, you're still looking at, at the biggest site, the biggest center being um, maybe 12 hectares, as opposed to the contemporaneous or Varka at 250. We're talking about a very different scale of things. But more importantly, urbanism is not about a site. Urbanism is about an urban system. It's about the way functions are distributed. It's about the way um, authority is being you know, exerted from a center. Um, it's about a society where you have specialized production, mass production, societal um, um, differentiation, and so forth. And so really, none of the societies in the Kura Rocks to me are urban. Um, and I would say beyond that, in the Southern Levant, the societies, the wall societies are not really urban. And we have to be very careful because we have to be sure what we mean when we use these terms. Okay, so I'll stop being an anthropologist and get back to talking about the data. So with these tools, let's see if we can make some sense. First of all, in terms of it being Iran, the first thing we have to understand is that modern borders have virtually nothing to do with ancient realities. Uh, in this map, you'll see all the little blue dots are within the, the national borders of, of Iran. And as you can see, it encompasses a wide variety of different of those subregions. Kona Shahar is certainly part of the, the core, the, the homeland. Um, Kotepi Jaffa, uh, Kuna, and those sites along the Eastern um, Araxes and the Mill Steppe are certainly part of a different environment, a different subset, um, but are very different than the two large um, Iranian groups, which are the ones around Lake Urmia and the ones to the south and east of Lake Urmia. So when we talk about Iran, we don't necessarily mean anything. In terms of time, boy, what a, what a complicated mess this is. This is a, a, a relative chronology chart of all the different relevant sites and the different um, schemes that have been come up with um, and how we're trying to use relative chronology in this case to sort out what is a horribly complex uh, series of occurrences. So the first thing when those of us who met in Toronto said was that old system is just not gonna really do it. Because in fact, time is an independent variable. You know, when we're trying to explain change, when we're trying to explain how one subregion interacts with another subregion, we're talking about real time. It is 2021 here in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa. If we're gonna talk about events happening in 21, if we wanna talk about the pandemic, we're not talking about it in relative terms, we're talking about it in absolute time. And so we adopted what Ruben Medallion has been playing with um, for his Armenian material. And we said, let's therefore look at it 
in absolute terms. And so we basically said, let's look at stratigraphy and let's look at carbon 14, which is about the only absolute measure we've got. Uh, and what you see is a chart that Steve uh, Badio put together uh, of all of the uh, carbon 14 dates that we have that he regarded as um, legitimate, that the lab was good, that, that we had a good control of where it was from um, and so forth, and then did a, a real Bayesian analysis. And what you see in, the, in that is it's very clear that from an absolute basis, the Kuroroxa starts at 3,500, and that first phase continues at about 3,000. This we call the Ka1. Now, sound familiar, like the LC123. Um, and that there was a second phase, which went from 3,000 to 2,500. So these are ones, um, and we will be, as soon as we can work out our, our deal with Engineer East or one of the other, uh, we will be putting online all of the carbon 14 dates that we have. So if anyone wants to play with it and tell us how wrong we are, uh, be my guest, you're gonna have it all to play with. So we're talking about two distinct periods, although of course there are transitions and there are differences. When you look at the Kurorox again and again, you realize how many transitions there are and how many times the adoption process from one area to another is not immediate is actually slow and very different from place to place. Okay, so if you're looking at the maps of the many, many sites, the little red dots are Ka1, um, the green dots are Ka2, and the yellow dots are where there's Ka1 and Ka2 on the same mount. Uh, so the left basically covers the upper province of the homeland, the one on the right, is the lower the Arexes one. And what you see on the reds is number one, how few they are and how widely scattered they are. These are small sites. This is a classic egalitarian, horizontal egalitarian society from everything we know about it, which admittedly is not enough. The Ka2, as Arexian points out, you see a tremendous increase. I mean, a five-fold increase in the number of sites that we've been that we found, and surprisingly few of them actually have both the Ka1 and the Ka2 on them. There are somewhat differences in, in where these are, but not as much as people have tried to make out. But there's something happening between these two periods that marks a really land sea change in what's happening. So what about the Iranian peace? Obviously, in the homeland, Kona Shahar is part of the homeland, um, although it doesn't actually begin, uh, according to Ali Zadeh, until 3200 and then continues until the end of the Kura Rocks at 2500. That subregion, uh, which our friend Sapide Maziar has been writing brilliantly about, um, goes from all the way through the Kura Rocks. Um, but there are really marked differences that mark it very clearly as a different subreach and different dialect um, of the Kura Rocks. Um, west of Lake Ormia, our best guess, and again, we're really dealing in a lot of these sites with a dearth of information and certainly hardly anything in the way of carbon samples. But our best guess is it's about 3,100 until, well, we're not exactly sure when. Um, we heard from Jeff last week. Uh, he said, and I completely agree, that we're probably talking about 3,100 to 2,500 BC. In the Western Zagros, so the area around Godin, um, we have enough to say fairly clearly, we're talking about about 2,900 to 26, 2,500. Solduz is a problem because yes, there are a few sherds at Hassan Lu, but the most recent survey found almost no other Kororoxi sites in Solduz. So I'm not sure that it's even a part of this Kororoxi's world. So now when you look at the Iranian part of this picture, 
you'll see that, of course, there's virtually nothing from the Ka1 in it. It's all Ka2. And it tends to be concentrated in two areas, one around Wormia and the other in the central western Zagros. I can't resist saying something about the Uruk since people have been writing recently how, you know, it was the Uruk that overthrew the, it was the Kururuks that overthrew the Kururuks, the Uruk system and so forth and so on. Um, and from what I'm seeing, the answer to that is no. It really isn't the case. I would say if in fact the temple palace uh, system at Arslan Tepe was overthrown, was burned, was destroyed from the outside, the odds are so much greater that it was actually someone from Northern Mesopotamia that did the job rather than someone from the Kururox. Usually, in fact, when the Kururox appears, it's either as part of an already existing community, which continues a sort of small district, think of Tepechik or one of those places, or it happens after the old Uruk system has gone. Certainly at Godin, we have a full meter of aerial and water blown systems of fill over top of um, 6-1. Uh, and oh, by the way, hold your hats on the oval lovers because a, a student, uh, Rasha at um, University of Toronto is working on a dissertation, which I'm helping her on. And her claim, which I think is unfortunately looks like it may be true, is there was no oval wall in 6-1 at Godin Tepe. But that's again, another whole story. And in fact, once the Kororoxus is established, particularly in the Ka2, they seem to actually avoid Mesopotamia. Um, there, there seemed to be almost like a borderline, a frontier beyond which they don't go. Um, and so again, to think that this is because of the Uruk influence, I think just doesn't fit the facts. Okay, so what is the organization, particularly in this, the homeland and in the Iranian, uh, I'm not doing well, and in the Iranian. So we have to look, of course, at the organization of production. Um, and this is something I urge everyone to do. We sat there for weeks and weeks in the, one of the most boring activities known to archeologists, but we measured 1,400 um, sherds from Shengavi um, with in great detail um, from only the best context um, and every kind of pottery we could find to find see if there are standardization. Standardization basically means that the organization of production is such that you have the same people making pots largely for the purpose of exchanging or trading them with somebody else. This goes back to my idea earlier about where is pottery made. The most uniform pottery you're gonna find in the Middle East is Roman, which is made in very few places. And it looks the same wherever you find it. Unfortunately, it's the ugliest stuff you could possibly find after bevel rim bowls, um, but it's identical. It's specialized, it's manufactured centrally by these people. But when you actually look at the figures for these types, what you find is this huge variability. So we look at, I call these the eating pots. So this, this type here, the S-shaped smaller vessels, uh, which I think are actually eating pots. Um, the variation in the circumference of them goes from 3.6 to 9.37 centimeters. The thickness of the walls is equally as variable. Now a standardized, manufacturer is not going to have this great variability. Same thing happens at Godin Tepe, huge variation. So what we seem to be seeing happening here is people do have this idea in their heads, this style corpus in their heads about what an eating pot should look like. But when they actually sit down to make it, it's incredibly variable how they're making it. And we're talking about many smaller potting establishments, probably not even workshops, which really imply specialized production for some other place. Obsidian, of course, is one of the hallmarks, certainly in the homeland, of 
the Korah rocks. But it's interesting when you start doing in the work of Padalya and Shedingir, uh, Blackman and others has really been very uh, illuminating on this topic. You in fact do not see a tremendous change across regions of this particular obsidian. In the Neolithic, you do find obsidians from Armenia in the Levant, but thereafter, very rarely do you find obsidians outside the region. All of the Mesopotamian stuff seems to be coming from Supanda and Bingal um, and so forth and so on. But within the homeland, between, within these two areas of the lower uh, and upper um, provinces, you find that people tend to be exchanging within their local areas. People use the same sources for almost the entirety of the Kura rocks. Rarely does anybody have material that's more than 20 to 60 kilometers from their home base. Um, and, in, and in fact, you don't see real specialization. You don't see this is a trade item. Uh, for Shengavit, there are two sources. One are blocks, of which there are some. There's a wonderful mountain in Mushakan, not very far from Shengavit, where blocks, huge blocks of obsidian are literally just rolling out of the side of the hill. But most of the stuff is uh, our excellent uh, lithics person, Dan Rahimi, or Dan, uh, has been finding out are in fact from little nodules of obsidian that are rolling down the Harajdan River and being picked up by local people. And so we seem to be seeing, as you would think, given the style dialects of these regions, you seem to be seeing the economic organization being very local. So you're trading within this local area, you're controlling, no one seems to be controlling the sources so it's not like I'm controlling it and I'm, I'm exchanging it for something else or someone else. This is just a very different kind of decentralized system than the ones we tend to see. And it's interesting in that regard that when you look at the Shengavit production, um, which is mostly obsidian, except interestingly enough for sickles, all of which are um, made of flint. And there's a wonderful example where you can still see the bitumen uh, where it was attached. And we haven't found that much evidence of production of these sickles at Shingavit. But virtually all of it is made from flakes. So even the one that looks sort of like a blade, it's just a flake being knocked off. The same happens even when you have a big chunk of obsidian. They're not preparing a core and doing beautiful blade technology. They're just knocking off a blade, flake and then making it into whatever they want. Lots of gravers, blades, um, augers, things like that. And of course, the infamous um, arrowheads, uh, whose purpose, whether symbolic or actually for hunting or warfare, uh, I couldn't tell you at the moment. It's also interesting that the only obsidian you find at Arslan Tepe are the arrowheads. But after we've shown all of the style connections between Shengavit and Godin, the the lithics production system of Godin has absolutely nothing to do with the one from Chengavi. It is a classic bifacial blade technology, virtually no obsidian at all, uh, as Jeff told us last time was true of Yannick. And so even though you have these cultural connections in terms of the actual systems of production, everything tends to be very local. Um, Barbara and her, her wonderful uh, talk on Arisma, uh, sorry, Barbara, I stole your image, um, makes a very good case for a copper sort of district within Iran. Um, in her talk, she says, they're basically extracting the material, doing the initial smelting, and then Mesopotamia, they're doing final production. Um, and she's talking about her work times, not um, our times. But I think it does actually hold true for the Kura rocks as well. When you look at sites uh, in the map on the left, or my left anyway, uh, where there are Yannick Ware um, style, dial style dialects, it really covers much of the same area 
as Barbara's map of, um, of the copper zone within Iran. And I think not coincidentally, I think you're seeing areas of exchange, you're seeing routes of movement, both along the north-south Zagros and the east-west. Um, it does end by Tepe Hisar, um, which is a different, people tend to confuse the gray wares of Hisar with Kororoxus, they really are very different pottery. And you see evidence at sites of production. Um, in the 1A level of Godin 4, so the, the last of the Godin 4 levels, um, there are next to this big building, which we'll talk about later, there is a building that seems to be a kind of craft center. They're manufacturing um, blade technology, um, they're butchering animals, and very clearly they're making smelting and making copper. Um, you see some of the, the crucibles from Godin 4 1A, uh, and in fact there is a um, some sort of fairly large uh, furnace um, pyrotechnic um, area within that manufacturing building, complete with all sorts of slag uh, lying around outside of it. Um, unfortunately, the story about Godin and, and Four is that it was dug very quickly. Uh, once they saw the so-called oval, and particularly when they found uh, the 6-1 tablets, um, they pretty much went crazy because it was the last season getting down to the so-called oval. And so they really rushed through for, and we don't have the kind of documentation one would like. Some of the buildings I reconstruct from a thumbnail sketch um, in the rather difficult to understand um, field notes. I think I've got it pretty much right, but you have to understand there are lots missing. Uh, obviously, it Konishahar in the, the walled in district. And again, it's just the district, it's not the whole site. And the wall is nothing like the one you're gonna see in a minute from Shingavi. Um, but they have a very sophisticated system of, produc of producing um, metals as well um, from smelting furnace um, and to airs, to crucibles, to hammering tools and so forth, and are producing the sort of materials you see Below, um, the, the big hooked one is not apparently a sickle, it's a lot smaller, but is part of a leather making um, enterprise. And I found much to my surprise when I had to do the uh, bone tools from Shengavit, how many industries there were that we talked nothing about. There's clearly a basket making industry. There's clearly um, extensive production of leather goods, um, and we simply don't talk about them because we tend not to talk about the tools that are made and they don't last in the ground. So when we want to look at the spheres of exchange again, here's a map that shows all of the raw materials that we're talking about. And I think we're still talking about fairly narrow areas of, um, of exchange. Uh, I talked to Karim Alizade about where the stuff from this production district of Kunishahar went. And it was really not very clear, but when I look at some very particular items, like these little objects, these little jars and um, spindle whirls with a circle within a circle design, you don't find them very many places. You do find them within the lower province. You do find them at Shengavit. And so I suspect that it is not, again, production for a large scale exchange. It is a local system where you're exchanging within a narrow area. Um, I'm sort of getting to my hour, so I'm gonna to try to speed up a little bit. Um, plants, the interesting thing about plants, it's mostly wheat and barley, as you would suspect. The higher in elevation you go, the more barley in relation to wheat, the further south you go, the more wheat in, in relation to barley. The interesting thing, of course, is that they produce very few oil producing plants, you know, lentils, peas, or other legumes. Uh, Hosepian's theory is that they're actually using animal protein to replace those. Um, and in fact, the whole of the Kurox 
is on a model from the highlands of what's now Armenia, where people still do the same exact thing. So the, what would be the Sioni um, region of the Calcolithic is the model that becomes a more general uh, model for the other. Sheep and goat, also very interesting. Um, you have a much higher percentage of cattle in the Kur rocks than you did in the Calcolithic. This could be for meat because remember, one cow gives you so much more meat than one goat or one sheep. It could be for plowing, it could be for pulling carts of, to move this goods. Again, we can't say for sure, but I think any and all of those are possible. Again, the higher elevations, the more cattle, the lower, more sheep. Um, Siavash Samai, who has been working on this, points to the fact that herd security may be part of the choice. Sheep and goat are actually much more resilient to low water or grass availability, and they produce offspring much faster and they mature much quicker. And so you actually get a turner, a much quicker turnaround uh, from production of those than you do from production of cattle. The kill rates are interesting as well. Um, in many places, what you're seeing is a preference for the meat. So you're killing the animals early, you're getting the best quality of meat. And yet a chingavit and a godine, the kill rate is much older, which tends to be ones where you're emphasizing wool and milk, because you're still gonna be getting the milk and the wool in an older animal. Um, an alternative may be they're just killing off the young um, because it preserves the mothers when they have to move. What is unlikely is that we're looking at pastoral nomads, even though I myself early on thought that the Kuroxes were, I've changed my mind utterly. Because the kill rates don't look like that of pastoral nomads, aside from the fact we really don't have much actual evidence of them. So again, to run through this fairly quickly, KA1 would be totally egalitarian. It's made up of self-sufficient units, an equal distribution of material and capital, domestic production, consensual decision-making, and random layout of small, equally sized and furnished buildings. The KA2 is mostly still egalitarian, but we're seeing equality sharing. That means different units, different households within it are competing to some degree with other households. It's not an overall sharing, but sharing within units and then among the different units. It's still mostly self-sufficient, although there are now the appearance of some coordination, some necessary um, organizing of tasks. Mostly it's equally distributed. Domestic production is the common and trade is within a, a generally local area within the, the basically the dialect zone. There are few signs of unequal status, either in the houses or in the contents of the houses or certainly in the graves. And there are much more regular planned settlement layouts. Centralized storage of good appears and we have some places that I would call centers. By the way, at this point, I do not use the term village, town, or city at all for the Kororoxus because I think they don't really help us understand what the nature of the functions of these places are. I basically talk about settlements and centers, um, but I think we need a new language to talk about them. The site layouts are completely different from place to place. We have Kona which looks very planned with the district and then the lower town and the cemetery. We have Yannick, which might as well be Halaf, this sort of this random mis mix match. Uh, even Kavach Chelebi, which is a very regular type of house, the actual layout of the, the settlement is pretty random. And at Godin, even within two levels of the um, EB, um, the Gooding 4-1-A and B, you see very different styles, very different layouts of organization. So there's just this wild randomness about local um, use of different spaces. The houses do change. A Chengavit would clearly go from a, a one course 
round building, probably domed, to a larger um, one with a different roof system that has auxiliary rooms, which sort of looks like the, the Yannick Tepe building, if you look at the two of them. And at the end, we have this remarkably different building, which is a seven meter by 14 meter um, building with an annex and interior dividers. Again, when you look at, at Godin, you're seeing all sorts of different styles. It looks like a series of apartments uh, around a circular form, which is very reminiscent of um, Polo Sakyol with its semicircular whole buildings um, and so forth. But again, really high variability that's a little hard to make a general idea. Again, in the K2, there are clear, some clear indications that whether it's within the horizontal uh, egalitarian or just merging into the uh, ranking society, uh, although again, we'll see no indications of it in burials or ritual, um, you do have signs of coordination. Yes, there is the Schengavit wall. Uh, for reasons that always mystified Hakob and myself, there's all this talk about the, the Schengavit wall being, you know, Hellenistic or whatever, or, you know, Kurgan period, when of course there's absolutely no evidence of architectural remains from the Hellenistic or the Kurgan period. And so I finally convinced Hakob this year. So what you're seeing is literally a week ago. Um, this is the wall. This is the bottom of the Schengavit wall. Um, you see a little picture in the top of by Portian who saw the entire wall. It's basically a bunch of large stones on the outside, little stones, and they just piled up. It's, it's not a very formal wall at all. But he dug to the bottom of the wall, and what he found was, in fact, there they laid down the bottom layer on a platform of pounded mud, mud earth, uh, in which were a number of small rooms which were not cut by, but abutted the wall. And the wall itself was kept up not by a, a wall trench that I'm familiar with from Mesopotamia, but actually by building a mud brick retainer to keep the bottom of the wall steady. And in that little rooms that abut do not, are not cut by the wall are only Kororox's classic pots and other and ear, hair rings and things, all of which scream Kororox. So we think the wall is that, but we think it's fairly late. Um, it doesn't get built until at the earliest about 2650. So it's being built in the K2, but late K2. So something is happening at that point, whether it's for defense or it's an attempt to use the recruitment of labor um, to reinforce new kinds of uh, organizations of control. I, I really don't know. There aren't a lot of military weapons. The other thing, Chengavit, is an unbelievable number of very large grain pits. We know they're grain pits. We get grain from the bottom. Um, but like tens of the 20s, the 30s of them, all in the northern area, all grain pits, way, way more grain storage than the population of Shingavit, which couldn't be more than about a thousand could have used. And so they're somehow using a surplus. And we think we're also seeing an intensification of production of grains to fill these things. They're being used by somebody to do that. Um, the public building of Godin 4 which has many similarities to the to, uh, building 36 um, from Arslan Tepe um, 6B1, um, really looks like it's some sort of feasting center uh, with you know, black painted benches around the outside and some sort of central platform which I think if they dug faster, they would have found some interesting things on. And a kitchen, the same sort of format you see at Palur, the same sort of thing you find at M5 at, at Schengavit. So we see a pattern of some sort of uh, coordination occurring. The settlement pattern, the only one we really have is Godin. 
uh, for Iran. Um, and it's really interesting because there aren't that many um, core access sites. And they tend to be at the two entrances to Kangavar. So they're controlling, as did the 6 1 people, they're controlling the access to the valley. They're all hugging pretty much tightly to the rivers. And they're ignoring the most populated and agriculturally richest part of the valley uh, in the lowlands. So there's something very different about this occupation. And I would love for someone to go to one of these places and dig it up and see what's happening in the early third millennium as far as what they're using. I would bet you there's still 6-1 continuing on uh, into the Kuroxus period. So they haven't gotten rid of the people. They've simply moved in, taking control of some of the sites which were already abandoned um, and setting up a control system for working through the valley. Ritual, to be brief, um, very much seems that of the, the household for most cases. Um, it seems very di directed toward the hearth. Um, there's very few signs of anything centralized other than perhaps the Godin building and the, really the Godin building. And in terms of um, burials, we really don't see much marked social differentiation. So I would say that, that the Kurox is a society of relatively small agro-pastoral uh, groups. I would say it originates in the South Caucasus and all of those groups showing up in Iran in periods afterwards, if you look at the dates, 3,500 in the homeland, and then about 33 going to the West, um, into the Taurus, about 31 moving East into the area of Lake Ormia. I think we're very much seeing an origin in the homeland that is in the South Caucasus, and then a migrant movement, not again, a flow or a wave like the Neolithic um, into Europe, but as I've called it before, a ripples in the stream, a very random group of small groups, maybe 200 people at a time, moving out into these other areas. Um, the K1, as I said before, is very diffuse and horizontal egalitarian. The K2, you see a really large increase in sites but at the same time, a balkanization of style dialects. There are some signs of coordinating bodies, but they're not accompanied by differentiation in housing or signs of specialization in production or production for large scale exchange. And then about 2600, you start to see the collapse of the system. Certainly at Godin, most of the diaspora is virtually invisible if it exists after about 2600. It, there's a transition in the homeland where you start to see early Kurgan period pottery appearing in that last phase of uh, Shingavi. So it's not just a cut, but there's this transition going on that you can actually see there. Okay, well, thank you for being patient.